one God, amen. Today is the first Sunday of the blessed month of Kiak. And as an overview of the month of Kiak, we have to look at the big picture. We focus on the incarnation. We focus on nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Sunday Gospels, the readings are taken from the first two chapters of the Gospel of St. Luke. And it's done in such a way that about 25 or so verses are read each Sunday. So if you see, for example, today we read from uh, verses 1 through 25. And then we'll continue on next Sunday and so on and so on and so forth. And so the gospel, uh, the gospel reading of the feast, for example, is taken from Luke chapter 2. And so things like that. Uh, the gospel passage today, we hear about uh, the events leading up to St. John's announcing and his, and his birth. Um, but we mainly focus on the parents of Zacharias and Elizabeth. And so the gospel of today states that the parents of St. John were righteous. They were blameless. Um, they are uh, the priest, Zechariah, and St. Elizabeth. And they lived in the ancient city of Hebron. And they reached an old age without having kids because St. Elizabeth was barren. And one day, while St. Zechariah was serving in the temple in Jerusalem, he saw the archangel Gabriel standing on the right side of the altar with incense. And Gabriel predicted that St. Zechariah would father a son. And he would be the one to announce the Savior of the world, the Messiah, uh, the one that's awaited by the Old Testament church. And Zechariah was troubled, and fear came upon him. He had doubt. And he couldn't think that his old age, it was possible to have a son. And he asked Archangel Gabriel for a sign. And it was given to him. He was, it was given to him as a chastisement for his unbelief. And so... Zechariah was struck speechless. He was struck mute until the fulfillment of Archangel Gabriel's words. And so, unfortunately, we don't have time to review the entire passage in detail and break it down part by part, but I think it's important to raise up important themes. St. Luke is the only gospel writer who recounts the foretelling of the birth of St. John the Baptist. And there is a clear pattern in St. Luke's presentation of these events. There's the announcement of St. John, the announcement of Christ, right? There's the birth of St. John and the birth of Christ. And in the middle of those events, there is the visit of St. Mary and Elizabeth, um, those two women with unexpected kids, right? Um, and they meet each other. And I think if we look carefully at this, St. Luke wants us to pay attention to this pattern, to get the reader to compare and contrast St. John the Baptist, and our Lord Jesus Christ. An example, both kids are announced by, in advance, by Archangel Gabriel. Both births are considered miracles, for sure. In both cases, the angel tells what the name should be, and so on, elements like this. But I think even more important than similarities are the contrasts. St. John was born to an aged and, and barren woman. Our Lord Jesus Christ was born to a virgin. St. John was given the name, which means God is gracious. Christ's name means Savior. St. John was, was to prepare for the Lord. And our Lord Jesus Christ was the Lord who would reign forever and ever. And in this way, St. Luke helps Theophilus, he helps us, to see some important truths. One is that God is uniquely involved in the birth of these two important men. And this is an important thing for Theophilus, for us to see about the history of Christ. It originates with and is guided by the hand of God. See, it was not easy for a Roman official to believe that a poor Jewish teacher executed as a criminal is in fact the son of God. And so such a man could be an eternal king and savior of the world is very hard for Theophilus to grasp. So St. Luke starts at the beginning to show that this man and his forerunner were no ordinary people, that God ordained and ordered their births. And there's another thing I think St. Luke wants us to see in the contrast between the announcements of our Lord Jesus Christ's birth and St. John's birth. St. Luke wants Theophilus to see the right way and the wrong way to respond to the promise of God. The contrast is unavoidable. 
we look at how St. Zechariah on one hand and St. Mary on the other hand responds to Archangel Gabriel's promises that God is going to give them a child and make that child great. St. Luke clearly wants Theophilus to follow St. Mary's example, not St. Zechariah. So we have to read both responses. Zechariah says to Archangel Gabriel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, who stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent, unable to speak until the day these things come to pass, which you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Zechariah did not believe in the archangel Gabriel's promise. You know, he was in a spot almost like Abraham. But he did not respond like Abraham. When St. Paul said about Abraham in Romans chapter 4, verse 19, he said, he did not weaken in his faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead because he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith, giving glory to God. Zechariah did waver in unbelief. And I think St. Luke intends for us to contrast this response to St. Mary's faith. Because Zacharias' wife, in verse 45, later on in this month of Kiak, we're here, that St. Elizabeth honors St. Mary in a way that kind of sounds like a criticism to Zechariah. She says, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. So how did St. Mary's faith express itself? When the angel was finished predicting the, the miraculous birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, St. Mary said in verse 34, How can this be since I have no husband? Note the contrast. St. Zachariah said, How can I know this? And St. Mary said, How can this be? Zechariah asks for more evidence. St. Mary asks for an explanation. And there's a difference. Zechariah says he can't be sure. St. Mary says, I want to understand. Um, St. Mary receives a partial explanation, but Zechariah receives a rebuke. And he's made mute by the angel. And so I think St. Luke's point is this in front of Theophilus, in front of all of us. To be like St. Mary when you hear about Christ. Don't be like Zechariah. There are lessons that I think that we can learn from this contrast of belief and unbelief in St. Mary and St. Zechariah. First, I think it's possible to demand too much evidence before you believe in God's promises. It's not wrong to want evidence for our faith. Belief is not groundless. It's not blind, but there is a warning in demanding signs beyond what a humble and open heart would require. If we're really honest with ourselves, St. Luke shows us this vivid case later on in the Gospel of St. Luke chapter 11. When our Lord Jesus Christ, when the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks a sign. But no sign shall be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the men of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will arise at judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will arise at the judgment of this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Now, we have to understand that Christ is not belittling evidence for faith. That's not the case. He is exposing the hardness and the unrepentant hearts. Because they, they cannot see in his miracles the character sufficient for the signs of truth. And we sometimes fall into this in the Gospels. And this is a warning to us. Unless we become like Zechariah, demanding too much evidence before we truly believe in God's promises, before we allow ourselves to submit to his feet and to trust. How many of us, when we're 
laid low, dark, in very difficult circumstances, cannot believe that God is working something out for the infinite good until we hope that some ray of light, some extra evidence will come down from heaven and show us that it's going to be okay. How often do we fail to take God at his word? Remember when Archangel Gabriel said to St. Mary, with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing. And it's clear from St. Luke's narrative that God loves to keep his reliability by keeping his word where humans can see no possible way for him to do it. This happens to us in sin. We start to fall into the trap like Zacharias. We say things like, I'm an old man. My wife is barren. She's old. I can't believe it. I hope we, we pray that we are not like Zechariah. And God wants to teach us from this text. He wants us to know, trust him. It's almost like you can hear him saying that I can do the humanly impossible. It's like we hear the heart of St. Luke going out to Theophilus and to each one of us saying, just trust him. Trust him. Don't proudly insist on more signs that are necessary. Put your whole trust in God. It requires an amazing amount of faith. There's another lesson for us to learn from Zacharias' unbelief. It was preceded by a life of godliness and followed by a life of godliness. In other words, his unbelief is the same category as St. Peter's unbelief. His denial of Christ is a temporary problem. It's not a way of life. It doesn't define his character. Look at the description of Zechariah and Elizabeth in verse 6. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. So Zechariah was a righteous and prayerful man. At least this means that Zechariah was not a chronic unbeliever. Even the best of men and women can fall into unbelief every now and then. So sometimes, though, because of it, we might have to endure a chastisement because of our unbelief. It's fair. But God does not cast us away if we repent and we set our hope on him. So the lesson for us here is that we should not despair if we fall into unbelief. Instead, we should repent. We should accept God's forgiveness in Christ and go on blessing the Lord even more fervently because of his great mercy for us in our sinfulness. When we, what then have we seen from the Annunciation of St. John's birth? As a little summary, there's a contrast between St. Zacharias' response and St. Mary's response, and we learned a few things. Hopefully, we learned a warning to be careful not to demand too many signs before you trust God's word and his promises. We learned that it's okay to want to understand the ways of God, especially when they seem just unbelievable. The danger is having an arrogant or cynical attitude and staying in this way, not doing anything about it. And then we learned that nothing is impossible for God. And do not despair in unbelief. So we pray and we trust him to do the humanly impossible for us and to walk fearlessly in all his commandments. We pray that our Lord Jesus Christ will hear our prayers. And we pray for patience. We pray that he may give us perfect timing in our requests. We pray for strength that we don't doubt in our spiritual lives. But we always remember the promises that are freely given to us. And we ask for St. John's help in his intercession. And glory be to God forever. Amen. We send you greetings.